chapter number 20. Uh, good to be in God's house, amen. I like that. Let me see if I can find it here. I think it's in the Old Testament. I'm not sure. Amen. Psalm chapter 20. All right, we're getting back into the rest of the Psalms now. Uh, I, man, I enjoyed the 119th Psalm, uh, 176 verses, 22 stanzas, 8 verses per stanza, all of them alphabetized. Amen. Each one of them stanza goes with a Hebrew letter. Boy, what a blessing that's been. I tell people, you want to know what God says and thinks about the Word of God? All you've got to do is turn to Psalm 119. I think he explains it right. Amen. All right, so we're going back now, and we're going to start hitting. I, I break the Psalms down in three, three areas, and that's 1 through 50, 51 through 100, and 101 through 150. And I do that, That's the Hebrews also do that. They set it in three books. So what I'm doing, instead of just going straight through the Psalms, because a lot of times you get a lot of them, they're not redundant. But they carry the same theme side by side. So what I want to do is give you a little cross-section of that all the way through. You get to Psalm chapter number 20, a Psalm of David. It's Davidic. That's important to know tonight in light of what this psalm gives you. So I want to read verse number 1, and he, he sets uh, the psalm up in verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. But I want to look at in this, this whole thing deals with the day of trouble. I want you to know it, it's the day of trouble. It's not a day of trouble. You've got a lot of troubles in life. Evidently, he was talking about these real special times. You know, sometimes you have a problem that uh, just kind of uh, shades everything else. I think back to the days of Joseph when Pharaoh dreamed a dream. And it was about the seven good years, seven lean years. And each one of them you had the seven fat kind, the seven real lean gaunt uh, kind, and then the, those ate the fat ones up, and then he had the seven uh, corns, uh, sheaves of corn, seven of them real good, seven of them blasted by the east wind, the east wind, they ate them up. So it said, no matter how good your days are now, there will come a time that will overshadow them and you'll forget. And that's what he's talking about here. Now I want to read the psalm. We're going to go back and put it in its perspective tonight. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice, Selah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners the Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. David was one of the greatest men in the Bible. That's why I say it's important to understand that this is Davidic. Uh, David had a lot of problems. Uh, every king in Israel always has had a lot of problems. Why? You look at Moses with that rebellious outfit that he uh, sent down finally. <laughs> he blamed it all on God. He said, you know, you, you gave me this mess to handle down here. and Now you're going to have to help me with it just a little bit. So we find that it's Davidic. He was a man of many troubles. Some troubles that he had were relatively easy to manage. He just made a decision. He made, uh, did justice in some areas, and a lot of them very simple. But a lot of them were not. I go back, uh, some of them, and by the way, let me say this. Sometimes these problems are, are of our own making. I think the greatest problem that David ever had was Bathsheba. Uh, that was David's fault. It was something David brought upon himself, and God in his mercy and grace, uh, he took care of him and still put him back on that throne. And then in the New Testament, uh, he said, a man after mine own heart who will fulfill all my will. 
And he said that about David. I've often made the statement to you, and, and I hope you realize this, life's hard. When you know life's hard, you can make it. As long as you think it's going to be a rose garden out here, and it's not going to be. You young people, you say, I'll be glad when I get out of the house. One of these days, you'll wish you'd back in it. <laughs> you get out of here, then you get the brunt of this thing. Parents protect their children and shield them, and they need to do that from this world. But one of these days... The children to get out, they become grump. I think a little old movie called them grumps, grown ups. Uh, they'll be grown ups then. Most of us old people will be in heaven. So our problem's going to be over. But you look at the world tonight that they're going to have to live in. My heart goes out to our children and our grandchildren that they're going to have, they're going to reap the benefit of what's going on in America and around the world. If the Lord has not come back in a little while, and by the way, he's going to come back on time. Don't worry about him. He's not late, but he's not going to be early. There's a time when he comes back. I've heard preachers make a statement, when the last soul is saved, he'll come back. Uh, he's going to come back on time. He'll come back at the right time, regardless who saved, who lost, and that time is in his hand. But I thought about that. Uh, there's an old worldly song used to say, up high in April, shot down in May. But these mountains or valleys, one, are what caused you and I to grow tonight. I believe we need adversaries. We need adversity in our life in order to make us into what we are. It, it tests the integrity or the strength. You know, you'll never know how strong a building is until the right wind comes along. You ever seen how some stand when many fall? The integrity of that building or the strength of that building, it was built right with the right material in the right way to withstand that. When we built this back here, we put wind braces all up. We've got a 612 roof back here on the back. That's a huge roof. You get up inside, it's about nine feet or more up uh, from the ceiling itself to where you've got the pole down the middle. So it's, it's a long way up in the air. And what we did, because wind will cause that thing to begin to twist, we put what we call wind braces up. We go from one of the trusses down and tie that a cross and tie them down the other way and put them up across between them up the top. Makes it a little hard to walk between sometime, but it's, it holds that roof. Troubles will show you what your integrity is. I've often asked the question, what will it take to stop you? What will it take tonight to stop me? I believe that's a test of maturity, not what you accomplish, but what it takes to stop you. That's what is the test of it. So it talks about the day of trouble. He uses again a definite article. It's not a day of trouble. You have two uh, indefinite articles, and then you have what's called a definite article. An indefinite article just says, this is a pulpit, this is a Bible, this is a watch. That means that it's, there's one of many. But when you get into the THD, that's called a definite article. So it's defining something that is kind of a one-of-a-kind uh, one thing. I get tickled at the Germans. They call their car Das Alto. The car, not a car. Boy, they, they brag on what they have built over there, and they make good automobiles. But we find here that definite, it, it implies that this is not a normal troublesome day. This is something exceptional that David was writing back early in his lifetime. We know he killed a lion, he killed a bear, and he killed a giant and, and all these things. But early in his life, his metal was tested and we find here that it's being tested again. This particular psalm, I say it must have been a doozy. I put that in my notes. The psalmist cried out to the Lord, the only one that would be able to sustain him and succor him in this hard time in life. I, my mind went back to the oldest book of the Bible. They say it's the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job. 
Uh, they don't really put a date on that. Abraham lived probably about 2300 B.C. Job also lived in that time and probably, I don't know if they knew each other or not, but they were, they were in what's called the age of the patriarchs. And they write about Job, and when you take the book of Job, you find a man that understood what this, this verse and this chapter is about. He said over in, I think, Job 14, one man that is born of woman is a few days and full of troubles. It says he come forth like a flower and he's cut down and he starts dealing with that. You go back to Job chapter number one, you find that day, so to speak, he lost all of his children, he lost all of his flocks, lost his servants, he lost virtually everything, then he lost his health, and Job was in a mess. That's... I, I go back to that, and I thought about him. Uh, Job was a man who lost it all, but he maintained his integrity. This morning I mentioned this over in Job 1.20. It said, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. And all that loss, he, not just... They put sackcloth and ashes over their, on their heads and, and they wail, would weep and wail over and that. Job didn't do that. Job worshipped. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. He didn't know if he'd ever get anything back. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly one day may be that day of trouble that comes to you one day it may be that day of trouble that comes to Barbara and I one of these days they, they, you, you better rejoice in the light if you're feeling good today and everything's rocking uh, pretty well out here you better be thanking God for that I'm going to tell you because one day may be that day for you and I so what I want to do is I want to look at these verses in light of that. In verse number one, he said, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the, of the God of Jacob defend thee. Now, I want you to understand, he's not asking a question here. He's not questioning, will God hear me in the day of trouble? Will God defend me in the day of trouble? He's making a statement that God will do these particular things. It's a statement of fact. The Lord does hear when we're in trouble. Listen, so I believe you need to learn to pray early. He said, the Lord hear thee. Uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, we've, we use that old saying, are we down to this already when you finally start praying about a problem? I found that's a whole lot easier to preemptively, proactively pray about something. If you know something's coming up, you say, well, I can take care of it. I'm good at it. You watch something blow up. Something go wrong. You ever had a simple job? That thing turned in to be a nightmare before it's over with. I'm talking walking or working on an automobile, working on plumbing or electricity or whatever it is. I hate to do plumbing. I can do plumbing. I don't like plumbing. I found out two things about plumbers. Boy, old Lowell Kirkendall taught me a lot. He said a plumber's got to know that sewage doesn't run uphill on Friday's payday. And he said that <laughs> until you get in there, you're going to find out what you've got going. So we find that the Lord does hear us, but sometimes our prayer is the last thing that we get down to. And if we're not careful, here's what happens in it. If we don't invoke prayer to God quickly, sometimes damage gets done before we do that that will remain. You take David. David could have backed up a lot of times with Bathsheba. But if I read my Bible right, it was probably about a year after that fact with Bathsheba before Nathan came to him because the child had already been born. We find it a miserable year that he spent that he didn't have to spend. He could, he could have, hey, and there would probably have been some chastening with that. But the Lord said that the sword would never leave his household. Sometimes if you put off invoking God to help you out with something, then sometimes you may just wait a little bit too late. Over in Proverbs he said this, I love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me. 
Isaiah 55 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. So we pray early. And then we find not only will he hear our prayer, he'll defend us when we're in trouble. Over in Psalms chapter 9, I, boy, I love the Psalms. It said, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, a hiding place to where we can go. He said in the next verse, They that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So in verse number 1, we find a statement of two facts. One, God will hear you, and two, God will defend you at the same time. So it opens up the rest of these verses. Look in verse number 2. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Now, he's giving us some things that we need to understand about how we need to react. I believe when troubles come, you need to do the best that you can. I don't think that you need to lay down in the middle of the highway and ask God to protect you. I believe you have enough sense to get up and get out of the middle of the road. You need to, you need to be able to do that. Had a young lady on the side of the road one day. A uh, car broke down and she was on telephone, but she was probably this far out in the road. So I stopped and pulled over. And I told her, if you'll get in and steer the wheel, I'll push you off the road. So I pushed her off the road. And I asked her if she's going to be all right. And she said she had somebody coming. And she went and stood around by the back bumper of the car. And I told her, I said, young lady, you see that house up there? The house probably as far as that front door off of the road. I said, you go up there and sit on the porch until somebody gets here because somebody on a cell phone will pin you to that car up there. God gives us enough sense to help ourselves. But he made, he said, send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. What's he talking about? He's talking about the house of God. Now, when we think about the sanctuary there, he's talking about the temple, talking about the tabernacle of the wilderness that God would send help a crowd. But I thought about people, a lot of times when troubles come, they get unfaithful to church. I believe if you were ever faithful to church, when you're in trouble, you need, you're need you going to find help comes out of the sanctuary itself. Boy, I thought about how hard it is sometimes for people. They blame God and give up on the house of God in the middle of troubles. I don't blame God for my troubles. I tell God if there's a problem, I may not understand it, but I always tell God this, it's my fault. I'll take the blame for it, and I will just take her there, and we'll move on. But I believe we get so much strength out of church, strength in the out of Zion. I thought about the strength of our church family here. One of the most important things we have tonight is what we have gathered here. We are a close-knit family. And we, hey, we don't, we don't uh, ostracize people. Hey, we, let, we allow people to become a part of this and have a part of the family here at the church. But he talked about the strength that's going to come out of the sanctuary in the time of trouble. If you get in trouble, run to the house of God. If you want a place to pray sometime when it's quiet, come here. I don't know if anybody ever uses this. Miss Bonnie used to use this as her, her prayer closet. She would come and walk around the sanctuary and around these walls in here and just spend time with the Lord. And I've walked in before when she was in here. So I thought about, one, the house of God. Don't forsake the house of God. Look in verse number three. three remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. And he put that word selah after it. Some pronounce that Selah. I don't have any problem with either pronunciation. Uh, it, you can pronounce uh, E's and A's in different ways. But what he said was remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. I believe that if you're in troubles and you stay uh, close to God and keep your finances right, I believe you're, you're a whole lot better off of that. You know, a lot of times when people first start tithing, they have a little tight spot. 
A uh, man told me one time, he said that a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. He wrote that in the front of his Bible. I'll never, with every step of faith, you're going to find resistance. I think it was Dr. Bob Jones. I quote him quite a bit. And he said that that door moves on hinges of resistance. He said a step of faith moves on the hinges of resistance. So he said, not only you stay in the sanctuary, you keep your finances right. Uh, when Barbara and I left Kentucky, came to Greenville, South Carolina, I took probably a $35,000 a year uh, cut in pay in 1983. That, that may not sound like much today, 35000 I guess, still a pretty good cut. But 1983, I went down making $5 an hour. Barbara didn't work. We kept up our tithes. We kept up our mission offerings. We paid our children's uh, school at Tabernacle. We paid for my school at Tabernacle. And we just took care of business, and God took care of our business. So he mentioned something here that you could tie with finances. In verse number 4, he said, Grant thee according to thine own heart, and fulfill all thy counsel. We find here that you need to make sure that you get your counsel from the right place. Notice what he said. Grant thee according to thine whole, uh, own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. Where do you get your counsel from? Be careful who you listen to. One man in the Bible listened to a man by the name of Jonadab. But he got a whole lot of things in trouble by listening to the wrong. One king, when his father died, uh, the old men came in and gave him counsel. The young men came in and gave him wrong counsel. He accepted the wrong counsel of the youth, rejected the counsel of the old people, and destroyed a kingdom. So we find in trouble, be careful you get your counsel. One, get it from the Bible. I, I keep teaching you, stay in the book. Stay in the book. Guys, spend your life staying in the Bible itself, and you'll get your counsel there. Then you get your counsel from wise counsel. I like to pick the brains of old men. You say, why? Because young people haven't grown one yet. So I, I like the old ones. You, know, you can talk to old people, and they can work you through a problem. They may not be able to work anymore, but if you go to them, they've got a lot of years of wisdom and years of how to do things. So you find you get your uh, counsel from the right places. The Word of God, I call it an anchor in the shifting sands of human theology. It anchors us because our times are moving. If you're not careful, you get the wrong counsel from them. Then we find in verse number 5, I preached this morning on rejoicing. Notice what he said, we will rejoice in thy salvation. Now, he's in the day of trouble. But he's still thanking God. Hey, I don't know what's going to happen to me down here, but I know it's going to be over soon. I'll be home. Hey, that is the end result to which we ought to be living tonight. I thank God I, I want quant, uh, quality of life, not necessarily quantity of life. Uh, that's why I try to halfway take care of myself so that I can have a little bit of energy to get up and go and do things. The older you get, the more you slow down. The more you get sick, the more your body fails, the more you look forward to getting a new one on the other side. So he said, in that day of trouble, learn to rejoice. That's why he said in Philippians 4.4, 4, you can quote it, rejoice in the Lord, what? Always, singular. Again, I call your attention to the singular word. Not always, that's to an end. We do rejoice that way, but he's talking about in every aspect of your life. Good times, bad times, up times, down times. Just rejoice in the Lord all the way. He said, we will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God will we set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now, verse number five, he talks about our banners. We don't set up banners like they did in Israel. And yet we do set up banners. If you're living for God and you're living consistently for God, you don't have to go tell your neighbors about it. They'll already know it. You've got your banners up. I tell people when you start a new job, set your banner up. 
Walk in there singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, and it puts people on notice. Now they know who you are, they know you're not ashamed of who you are, and it cuts out a lot of the talk that goes on around you sometimes. I've, I've seen people actually apologize, say a bad word in front, and they would apologize for it, where normally they wouldn't have done that. So he talks about rejoicing in thy salvation. That rejoicing is inward and it's also an outward thing. And he said, we'll set up our banners, the Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Look at verse number 6. Verse number 6 says, Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. Now, we find in the last few verses this absolute confidence that David had in God. There were a lot of times when he faced armies that were much larger. Uh, I, boy, they, I, we were dealing, uh, were dealing with over in the, in the book of Deuteronomy that they're going in, the, the Israeli army, and you say, boy, they had a big army. He said, there are seven nations that are greater and more powerful than you are. So you're going to get an adversary to where the odds physically would be against you in that particular time, and yet you're going to take out not just one of them, but you're going to take out all seven of them in order. God with the first one, he said, I give you cities that you have not built. I give you these things you haven't built. The first thing he did, God showed his power in Jericho, but I don't find any other walls falling down. From that point on, they kept those cities and they lived in those cities. So we find, he said, I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. Now, he's talking about himself, right? God anointed him. Samuel came, took the anointing oil. He anointed Saul when Saul took uh, the office of king, and then he anointed David later. So he said, I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. The Bible talks a lot about the right hand of God. I don't hear it talking about the left hand of God. Most of you here are right-handed. Right-handed, if you're right-handed, the right hand is your power. I, left hand's my holding hand. Uh, if I ever couldn't use this one for a while, I don't, I don't believe I could brush my teeth. I'd probably knock holes in my cheeks. Uh, Barbara tried that when she broke her left wrist. She's left-handed, and she tried to brush her teeth right-handed, and just nothing seemed to work right. Same way with the back brush. I use a right hand, but sometimes if I've got to use that left, I can actually get the left up there better because it's not as large as the right, but I can't control it the same. He talks about the right hand of power. He said with the saving strength of his right hand. He said that God's not only going to hear, but you've got the saving strength of the right hand of God on your side to do whatever it did. Hey, with that hand, he spanned the universe. So we're talking about that God is a God of impossibilities. When it becomes impossibility for you, the Bible said it may be impossible with the men, but with nothing, hey, nothing with God is an impossibility, all right? Verse number seven, he talks about where your trust is. Some trust in chariots. Hey, good things. That was the transportation of the day. If you had a good chariot, uh, hey, you could travel a long way. That Ethiopian unit, he drove a chariot 3,000 miles round trip to worship. It kind of embarrasses us. Sometimes we won't drive across town to worship. That man came from Ethiopia and he came to the temp Solomon's temple to worship God. It was a 1,500 mile trip through the deserts. Just one way to do that. Some trust in chariots, thank God. Some in horses. You got a good horse. I like what Ronald Reagan said years ago. He said, a man is never so much of a man as when he's setting astride a good horse. I uh, thank God for horses. I'd rather have four-wheeler. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're talking about some put their faith in these things, all right? But the child of God doesn't. 
But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You say, why is it important about the name? Because the Lord, capital O, capital O, R, capital D. Again, that talks about the eternality of Christ, but also that he is self-existing. That God needs nothing to exist. I, he is absolutely self-existing. I, uh, we, I think we're uh, going to be shocked when we see God as He is one of these days. I believe when we step right into the presence of God and we're in heaven, we're going to see things. That's why I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man. We cannot imagine. Now, I love to go to Revelation 21, 22. You ever got a visual of that? One, that new Jerusalem coming down. But in chapter number 22, he talks about the throne of God. He said the river of life flows out of that throne of God. But he said in the middle of the street and on each side of the river was the tree of life. That tells me that that road, that road that's going, that street is what we would call a boulevard. It's got two sides to it. Got a river in the middle. The tree of life comes down and divides inside of the streets, but around that river. I think about that. I've, I've actually I sat down and, and try to visualize what God is saying when he's saying that. Boy, he said here, the name of the Lord our God. Listen, he owns it all. It's his, and God can take care of your problem. Look in verse number 8. They are brought down and fallen. This world's going to fall. I'm, I fear for America. America is going to bring itself down. Uh, my greatest fear is that in that she's going to get what she deserves, and I, boy, that that scares me to death. That America is going to get what she deserves tonight. Uh, somebody put a thing on the computer the other day, and I think it was. Uh, trying to think which one of the original people it was, but he just said, said that America was not founded on religion. It was founded on salvation in Jesus Christ. And he said that's what the founding fathers founded our nation on. He said they're going to be brought down. I don't know who they are, but they may have been the ones that caused the trouble. But he said, but we will arise we are risen and stand upright. Listen, we'll stand when the world falls. And then he ended with verse number 9, Save Lord. Two words, just save Lord. You know, that's all you need for salvation. Lord, save me. When you come to him, you've, you've got a repentant heart. Thank God for that. He just said, save Lord. This is your job. You know, sometimes you've got to leave God's business uh, to God. There was an old preacher one time said, don't mess with God's toys. There's some things about God we don't understand, don't know about. You just leave them in the hand of God. But he said, save Lord. Let the king hear us when we call. The day of trouble. One of these days, you and I are going to get in trouble again. <laughs> I, I pray to God that it's not of my making. <laughs> Amen. I, it's a whole lot better when somebody else does us evil than we have to pay for our own. But I thank God. He said, when you call, he said, the Lord will hear thee in that day. And he said, the name of the God of Jacob shall defend thee. Interesting word, and then we're through. The God of who? Jacob. Jacob was probably the least of the three fathers of Israel. Abraham was the friend of God. Uh, Isaac, not as much is said about, but Isaac was the promised seed and he just held the lines. But Jacob was a supplanter. Hmm? He was a deceiver. Boy, you go all the way through. Jacob was a little bit of a rascal in his life. He didn't say the God of Abraham. Boy, that would have sounded good. But he said the God of Jacob defend thee. God defended Jacob in spite of what he was. Amen. Let's stand tonight and we're going to have an invitation. Just a day of trouble. A lot said in the Bible about trouble. You say, why? Because we're going to spend a lot of time in trouble. 
We're going to have a lot of issues in this life. But you've got to let God help you handle them. You've got to handle the issues in a right manner. You've got to take, the t- take them to God. And when you take them to God, you've got to learn simply to 